All right. Well, I am going to um, get started here in just a minute. So my, my first question for everybody is, um, anybody that's doing commercial, I'll be interested to hear how the, um, how it's going with the SBA loan. So, you know, uh, we know uh, last night, I believe uh, Mnuchin, I think that's how you say his name. He uh, basically said, yep, but um, everybody's prepped and ready to go. And then uh, we filled out all the information for big last night and we got a brand new form this morning. Uh, yeah, you can't use version three, you gotta use version four. Looked at the timestamp on version four and it was like really late last night. So something must have been there, but um, I don't know if any Crayons are doing commercial lending or if they're involved in the CARES Act or IDLE. Um, IDLE being the emergency industry uh, disaster loan, which I don't think is done through the banks. I think that's actually maybe directly through SBA, but I'm not 100% sure. And then there's the SBA loan under the CARES Act, which is called the Payroll Protection Plan, which allows you to um, look at up to uh, $100,000 or $33,000 per quarter of salary for, um, for your employees as long as you bring them back uh, during a certain time. And then there was even a, a, another question around um, whether or not Crayons could participate in this, which... Uh, We've heard both sides of it. We've heard yes, we've heard no. So um, I know Mike Lawson is trying to chase down a, a definitive answer on that. So those would be some of the topics for discussion today. A couple other things that popped up. And then um, I'm gonna right away say, uh, I see Chris is on and from Suncoast and he had uh, said he'd be willing to talk uh, today. So I'm hoping um, to hear from them just because Florida seems to be heating up a bit. And uh, Suncoast is my alma mater. It's where I started in the Crayon space. And I'm, I'm looking forward, not looking forward, but I'm look, I want to hear what they're doing and, and what's going on. So I'm excited about that. I see Tom's here. Uh, good update from New York would be great. And New Jersey, which you know continues to explode. So we'll, um, we'll get to it. Uh, a lot of people, um, uh, a lot of people out there. I don't think Mike's here. Mike, are you here? I'm gonna say he's not. I think he's, he couldn't make it today. So it'll just be me today, but normally Mike's here as well. I uh, would like to thank, uh, I know Doug Burke's going to be on for a little bit, um, the Crayon Service Network. Also, um, we haven't got the information up yet, but Dante's here from um, C Ledger slash um, member pass. And uh, Dante, uh, they're our new sponsor as well. Um, so we'll be including them in the list and, and getting that updated. So we're excited to have them. Um, so let's move to the next one here. So... I'll just go through it quick. Uh, we're trying to make sure everyone has a chance for input. I know that the input's getting short, so I'm kind of sharing stuff I'm finding. Because of Zoom bombing, you're gonna make sure that uh, everybody checks in. Uh, just wanna make sure, you know, particularly I'm worried about Tom from Aspire. If anybody's gonna Zoom bomb, it'll be him. Uh, that's probably just a shirt he can rip right off and nobody wants to see that, Tom. We love you, but uh, so we're just gonna make sure that doesn't happen. Obviously, if you wanna talk to someone, please do. Uh, we'll be putting that out uh, there. Um, and then uh, if, if there's something for the broader audience, please put it into the everyone. Uh, we record these, so make sure whatever you're saying, you're okay with being out there on the web. Uh, let's move to the next one. Seems like everybody's getting really familiar with Zoom. We actually need to update this screen because they just updated their software last night. Um, there's a brand new... Uh, version out that fixes some of the security bugs. Also adds some new features like you can react to things. Um, so just a heads up on that. You should make sure you're downloading the new one of these if you're using it for your business because there are some security and privacy features that need to be fixed. But in the meantime, if you want to get into chat, um, if you just got the window up in front of you, for those who might be new to Zoom, um, then uh, you'll see there's the uh, mute and the start video. That little, this little guy down here in the bottom he, um, let me just annotate here for a second. So this, this window here on the bottom, um, it does not, it, it hides itself. So you have to hover over it. Then you're gonna hit this chat button here and then you'll get this little slide out and uh, should see a bunch of text in here. Right here is where you can either talk to everyone or you can talk to someone privately. So we hope you'll use that. Right now, we'd like to ask that every single person check in. If you don't check in, we're gonna assume you're a mad Zoom bomber and uh, we're going to boot you from it because uh, we're just trying to avoid that uh, 
in this particular mechanism. So, um, so with that in mind, I'm going to just share a couple things, and then we'll we'll get into some folks. So over the week, um, I'm actually going to go ahead. Can I grab the share here, uh, just for a second? Thanks. Um, so something interesting happened uh, a, a day or two ago. We suddenly had a couple of uh, you know, which I really didn't think was going to happen. But now that I've talked to them and kind of went over some things, we had a couple of Koreans that um, uh, were working on our CU voice registry, which I'm going to share on my screen right here. And what our CU voice registry is, for those of you that don't know, it's a very simple voice website. Um, what it does is it's a way for you to put a non, uh, you, you can't get to your account information, but you can put up all kinds of marketing stuff or whatever. Um, and we had a little run on these and I realized what people are doing with them, which is it allows you to record a message. And then you can, in, by the way, you could configure all this yourself. All you got to do is uh, put it out there. It allows you to record a message and then you can ask, um, I'm going to make sure I got no Alexas or Google Homes in the room, but you can ask uh, Alexa, you know, um, tell me about Aspire Credit Union and it will t play the marketing messages, give you information. Turns out that might be valuable, particularly for, uh, there's a lot of seniors that use it. Um, so hadn't thought about that as a use case, obviously, because I've never brought it up, but it does make some sense. It's very quick to do and it's cheap. Um, we, uh, I think uh, on the low end, if you're a small credit union, um, it's somewhere around a thousand bucks per year. And on the high end, it might be, I think 1500 to 2000 per year. So, uh, and we're able to pump these out real fast uh, because uh, we have a connection with Google and with Amazon. So it could be up very quickly and, and you could advertise it. And it's very easy to go in and record new messages and put them out there. So if it's something you're interested in, it was something that came up that I hadn't thought about and it would help us uh, here at BIG because we're continuing to struggle like everybody else, uh, filling out our PPP loans. So if it's something that you want to work with us on, we'd love to have you. Um, and then later on, if you want to convert that into a, a more uh, a more robust service or skill to where you can get into your accounts and stuff, we can certainly do that. Um, you can just upgrade from there. So just something to bring up, not to be a sales pitch, but it could be useful in these times to have something you don't have to touch to get information from. And uh, it turns out a lot of seniors and folks are using it. So that was one thing uh, that I wanted to mention. Uh, another thing before we get going as well was, um, and by the way, the uh, in case you're interested, cuvoiceregistries.com. I'll put it in the chat, but we'll also be emailing it out uh, along with the surveys. So, um, and everybody can see that screen, right? You can see it, Melissa? Yep. What? <laughs> and uh, if you had child bingo on here, you can put that out. Um, all right, so we're going to get right to the speaking. Um, and uh, what I'd like to have go first, if he doesn't mind, is Chris uh, Hempel from Suncoast. Actually, um, I apologize if you can go with someone else first time. We've got a little bit of a crisis. I'm trying to deal with with some small business loan applications Absolutely. right now. You do your thing, Chris. No worries at all. Paycheck protection okay. plan. Thanks. Hey, no problem. And that and that's exactly what we want to talk about. I'd love to hear that crisis. And that brings us to Tom, who also probably is participating in the PPP plan. Tom, would you mind going? He already unmuted. He knew I was going right to him. So yeah, I'll touch on two things, uh, a little bit on the, in the New York City uh, situation and then PPP real quickly as well. Um, this comes out of the category, uh, you can't make this stuff up. So uh, as you probably know, the USN Comfort pulled into New York Harbor uh, on Monday. Uh, they have a That's the big beds. hospital ship from the government, right? Yes, this is the hospital ship, has a thousand beds on it. Uh, as of Thursday night, there were, according to the New York Times, there were 20 patients on that boat, All right? Uh, New York is screaming like, for hospital Does it take time to fill it up or something? They've put, no, 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 it's, well, it's far worse than that. Uh, to, New York has, has came out and said, has come out and said, look, if, if you have somebody that doesn't have a pulse, don't bring them here to a hospital. Don't bring them, we don't have the room to capacity. So they're really just dealing with the crisis situations. However, so you would think the ship makes an excellent point uh, for these people to go to. So these ambulances, the EMSs in the city, just go to the to the to the ship and drop these people off. But, so so oh no. people that don't have COVID, right? Right. Okay. But like a heart attack or accident yeah. Normal, normal stuff. Normal, yeah, I, I cut stuff. my finger off. Gun a lot of people are at home. Yeah, the normal stuff that happens in New York. 
bring them to the ship. But no, to get on the ship, you have to go to a hospital, get tested for the COVID, be shown to not have the virus, then you can go to the ship. You can't make this stuff up. Um, so here's then, a thousand But isn't beds. the hospital completely backed up and isn't it impossible to get tests? Yes, and the hospital asking saying obvious you, questions. And there's hospitals saying, if you're not ill with the COVID, don't come to us. So the people that the hospital, and the ship doesn't want the COVID, obvious, for obvious reasons, but you know, it's just, it's the Three Stooges. It's, it's, it's crazy. You, you, you couldn't imagine this if you, so I'm hoping, I'm, I'm expecting they're going to get this worked out, but it's just, you know, these are head scratchers. What's going on here? What's yeah. going on? You know, they put oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I jabs. was they really hoping. Central, they put beds in Central Park. Uh, and here's a ship of doctors, full of doctors, medics, uh, medical personnel that are just twiddling their thumbs. Unbelievable. Amazing. Um, Unbelievable. On the I'm sorry to hear that. I was hoping that that, that, that would be something that would drive down the, the death rate in New York. Um, it, and it, it should. Was lower, so I was hoping that that was the effect of it, but um, it probably is just another one of those, sadly. And, and what you're seeing too, with by the city hospital saying, don't bring, uh, essentially don't bring terminally ill pe people here, people that are just like on their last breath, literally, literally on their last breath, don't bring them to the hospital, essentially let them die. You're seeing a mini version of what the, uh, you know, uh, Italy, Obamacare death panels look like. These hospitals are making life and death decisions based on resource uh, capacity and resource availability. They're saying, look, you know, you're too old, you're, you're ill, you're already, people they normally would otherwise bring in and revive, they're saying, we can't help them, you gotta let them die. It's, it's really, so, really sad. Yeah, that's, that's really horrible. And yeah. the impact for, for you guys is now, we don't know if they're dead. Uh, right. I can't even, I'm sorry. It's, it's just, um, yeah, it's amazing. So we'll follow the saga over the next several days and see if, if and when they get this all figured out. Um, on the uh, payment protection plan, the PPP, um, we now, we, we sent out an email to all of our commercial bar, uh, borrowers, which is around seven, 800 people. And uh, we partner with New Tech. Uh, we're an SBA lender, but we don't have an active SBA relationship. Uh, but we partner with New Tech in, in Long Island, which is, uh, they say they're the largest SBA lender in the country. Um, through this morning, through right now, we have uh, 220 people that have registered to get the application packages. Um, and we're expecting those packages will go out next week. Um, and like you said, John, these things, they're updating the applications hourly, it seems. There's some new boxes that they've added. And uh, you know they're trying to figure all this out uh, on the fly. And I, you know, I and I appreciate that the SBA is really just embracing this and saying, look, we got to push this through. But uh, yeah, there's far more questions than answers. And uh, you know, we'll see what happens with the processing and how this all flows and and what these folks get. Uh, can I ask a Can I ask a dumb question? Um, yeah. So, let, so you work with New Tech, and and let's say I'm a business. I apply for the loan and I understand my side of the loan now really well. I understand that um, I can apply for people who are my payroll employees and contractors up to a certain amount. Um, I can include mortgage interest. I can include rent interest, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, if I use it for the right things, then the loan is forgivable. What's the business proposition for Aspire? So if you, if, if you give me that loan, what is this? And it's a forgiven loan. Does the government pay the interest to you? Is that what it is? Or I, I'm just trying to understand. Um, see, because we're just referral, I haven't gotten too deep into it, but I believe it's, yeah, the government then pays the interest. The, it's now 1%. It had been a half a percent, but they've changed the interest rate to 1%. Um, so they would pay the 1% uh, for the term of the loan. But the application, you're applying based on your payroll. Right. It's a PPP, payroll protection plan. Right. But you can use the funds and it's two and a half times that up to a hundred thousand. So it's $250,000 maximum, but then you can use that for your mortgage, for your rent, and of obviously your, your payroll. Uh, but the basis of the loan is all purely on the payroll itself. Um, 
So yeah, there's referral fee in, in there. I know New Tech earns the fee. We're we're just facilitating this at this point because it's you know it's a lot of work that needs to get done, and we don't have sure. the infrastructure to support it. Sure. But, uh, uh, I just wondered the what the business model was for the banks and the credit unions to. I mean, I thought that was it, but um, and I see uh, Todd mentioned it as well. They get a fee from the SBA as compensation right, for the right. loan. Right. Um, so you want to, you know, it's an, I knew there had to be some sort of um, enticement for you to pursue that because right. it's certainly a lot of work on your staff. You heard Chris just a minute ago had to run off for an emergency for that. Um, and I imagine everybody's scrambling, uh, especially because um, I believe our treasury person, Steve Mnuchin, came on and said, yep, we're going to be making loans and people have money and everybody's ready by tomorrow. Um, and so that puts the pressure on you. Like for instance, we filled out our form only to get an email this morning that basically said, yeah, that scrap that form, start over. Right, 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 right. Now the two um, questions that we have though are, one, can the credit union apply for the, for the, fine, for the PPP right. itself? I mean, we can be lenders, but can we be an applicant and a borrower? And then, right. which is, no one has a clear answer on this. So our thought was, no. we'll apply if we get the loan, great. If they don't forgive it, it was a 1% loan for a couple of months. It's not a, you know, it's not a huge, huge amount of money. So we'll get some cheap money for a couple of months. If they do forgive it, so great. Then we got it forgiven. The second is, can our CUSOs apply? So we have a wholly owned CUSO, and then we have a shared services CUSO. Yeah, the member, yeah. That, so that can we be one of them. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to apply. And those CUSOs are, you know, they're definitely taking a hit. I mean, they're significant uh, loss of income for, yep. for, one, for our one CUSO in particular. So we're looking at, you know, how do we make this up to keep these, to use it for the purpose it was intended to keep these people employed uh, and servicing these, uh, those, these loans. Yeah, you know, I'm going to ask Doug to unmute just for a second because Doug has been talking to Cliff Larson Allen, I believe, or I think that's right. See, and he, yeah, he had sent me a note on that. Doug, what did uh, what more have you heard? Uh, when I when I reached out to him yesterday, you know, I asked. We had some conversations going back and forth just to clarify, you know, if by chance credits were able to participate, and they definitely came back and said, you know some IRS code and uh, reference that credits are not eligible, but QSOs are, and I know we're filling it out just as a precaution. And uh, so there's today, I guess, is the day that it all starts is, is what they told me. But um, so yeah, QSOs can, and they, they recommended that we do it. And, and so I think a general recommendation is jump in, put your name in there. Even if today you don't intend to use it, Tomorrow may be a different day or next month. So right. go ahead and do the process and, and at least you're in the queue because I think that's the challenging part is just getting into the queue because, you know, just like everything else. Yeah. Right, right. Um, so can we get that IRS? Uh, was it, Did he give us? I, I didn't see it in the email, but maybe you got it. Um, maybe we can post whatever that article is in the everyone. Yeah, I'll send it to you. Yeah, actually send it to Melissa. She'll grab it and post it in the everyone. And me, okay. if you don't mind. Yeah. No. Um, thank you, Doug. Thanks so much. So one last question for you, Tom. Are your people okay? Are, you know, New Jersey's like following right behind uh, New York in a big way. Um, yeah. You know, what's what's going on in that regard? Um, is everybody good? And Yeah, from the credit union side so far, everybody is, uh, you know, we've, we've all been working home for home, from home. Well, most, this five, uh, three, four, Five of us left here right now, uh, and we'll be migrating away next week. Uh, but yes, thank you. Uh, everybody is so far, you know, knock on wood, is everybody's healthy. So, uh, so far, That's so great. Good. But yeah, the curve is still going up. Um, well, I would expect to see everyone in mass probably maybe even by today. Right. Yeah, I, I, I would right. expect. I mean, obviously not in this situation, but um, I would expect that. And right. that's something else to think about from a Korean perspective. Um, do, do we provide masks? Uh, where do we get them from? And they're talking the uh, clo um, uh, um, you know the the other pieces. So those are all good things to 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 consider. Yeah, they're suggesting right now, not mandating or they're just suggesting that when you're in public meeting encountering any other people to have some type of face covering, whether it's a uh, a bandana. 
or a scarf or a mask to just start to uh, um, start to cover up. I hate to be horribly opportunistic, but my God, what an incredible opportunity for the Crayons to put their name on something and hand them out. Oh yeah. I mean, I hate to be a jerk about it, but I mean, if you gave them away for free, it sure would be nice and I wouldn't make it giant or something, but it could be something you could do. Um, you can't get them. That's yeah, the well, you, could, you, could, you could find a bunch of little old ladies in sewing clubs and mm -hmm. get rolling and put them to work and you'd be doing them a nice favor too because uh, they are out there. I can tell you, I'm part of Make for COVID, uh, which is part of the Colorado 3D printing. We have as many people sewing as we do printing. Wow. So that's, uh, that's an option. You could have somebody go check into it. I'm sure somewhere... In New Jersey, there are a bunch of sewing clubs just dying to, even if you had nothing, just don't put your name on, just hand them out. It would be a, it would be a great service. Yeah, I was reading um, a story earlier about all the, the 3D printers that they're now um, signing up or getting engaged. It's a pretty good uh, moment for the 3D maker community. Yeah, I actually have uh, three printers cooking away in the other room. I had to shut the door because they're loud, um, creating, nice. creating, creating masks and uh, sending them out. Excellent. Um, yeah, no, and, and I encourage all the gradients too. They can get in that spot as well. So, um, all right. Well, Tom, thank you so much for the update. Um, and uh, let's uh, let's see who else wants to the chat here. I see Mark Wilson is here from Florida. I don't know, Mark, if you were interested in uh, chiming in a bit. If you're okay with speaking, if you wouldn't mind just putting it in the uh, everyone group and I'll, uh, I'll call on you. All right, so while we get the next person up, I know, I'm sorry, was somebody gonna speak? All right, so while we get the next person up, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Tim Tibbles to share the re latest results from our, um, from our uh, surveys we've been sending out that you've so graciously been filling out and we've got another one coming. So um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Tim, because I know you have to go in just a bit, um, if you wouldn't mind uh, just giving us an update on the surveys. Um, as far as, the, excuse me, let me close my door, put a vacuum on it. Um, as far as the updates, has everybody seen what I, I I uh, did an update in the last couple meetings on it. I just want to make sure that if there's somebody new, I'll go over it. Um, otherwise, I'll talk about what's going coming out with the next survey. Does that make sense? Of course, yes, please. Okay, one moment. Let me uh, let me share. Sorry, you caught me a little off guard. So uh, this is something that uh, CU Service Network has uh, put together for the group. Uh, this is going to be a new survey that focuses more on the overall strategy. So, and uh, they're sending this out from, from their location. Um, and uh, we have access to the link as well. So the overall goal is to look at what's the impact on your projects that are coming up next week for the, fir the first few questions here. So. Um, are you continuing, what percentage of projects are you continuing as planned? Where that you're scaling back on requirements? Uh, are you putting things on hold or completely canceling projects? And if you have any other bits of reference, just go ahead and uh, type those in here. Um, on this one, we're going to look at, you know, what's the overall change to your revenue? Um, we're anticipating that, um, please ignore the value over here on the right, because it's not showing a the right value, but just, you know, look at it from the perspective that the uh, 50% means no change. And then you can go up or down whatever percent you want to. Um, if you have, uh, uh, looking at, you know, how much you're, you decrease. So based on how much you're decreasing your 2020 budget expenses, and then where are you focusing on where those expenses are going to be reduced? Uh, looking at the impact to your lending volume, and then also your uh, you know, what are you seeing right now in your member uh, channel usage? You know, did you see, you know, pretty much no change? Or are you seeing, you know, percentages going up and down on these different delivery channels? And then uh, as far as fraud, what are you seeing there? You know, are you seeing an increase in fraud or some other 
types of information that you'd like to provide, uh, looking at the different uh, channel methods, where you're experiencing fraud, if, it, if you are experiencing fraud, where is that happening? And then looking at um, you know, what types of uh, um, authentication methods are you using to secure your different channels since you know, there's such a huge influx in those channels? Are you changing your methodologies or are you, you, know, you know, kind of um, staying the way you currently are? And then just some uh, information on you know, who's providing the data. Uh, this information will be kept uh, confident or uh, confidential. So um, as soon as you get the link, if you could fill that out, that would help us uh, get back to you guys so you can see what's going on across the industry. Okay. Thank you so much. I know you were going to be uh, having to jump off soon, so I appreciate that. Great. Thank you. All right. I want to jump over to Kirk, who's in Long Island, New York. Um, and just get a sense of, you know, New York being sort of, I think what we see, you know, what's coming, uh, just get an update from him uh, and find out where they're at. Thank you, uh, uh, John. And uh, we're, we're in the same relative situation as Tom is over in at Spire and Nassau County and Suffolk County and in, uh, in New York now have gotten worse uh, and have gotten a little more intense. Um, same story though, our, our hospitals are filled up. Um, the uh, number of ventilators, uh, the number of people in ICU increases significantly by a third every three days. Um, and, you know, really the, it's the cultural transformation that's extraordinary to watch. Um, the, as, the, as the numbers creeped up and the fear increased, uh, people are uh, 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 watching themselves, towing the line much more so. Very few people out, uh, 80%, 75, 80% wearing masks and gloves. Uh, really, uh, you know, really sinking in. And it looks like a, a relatively long haul for us. Um, we've been locked down for another 30 days to April 30th. But right now, the, the peak is expected in the third week or so of April. Uh, so if that's true, you know, there's another side to the peak, right? If it's to the degree that it's a relative bell curve, uh, we'll have another four or six weeks after that of, of challenges. So um, a couple things that I saw, and I'm not sure if you're aware of it or if anybody's aware of it, but um, one, uh, it looks like they're relaxing uh, the Cecil regulation that was to go into effect. Um, mainly because uh, specifically around the uh, coronavirus aid relief and economic uh, piece there. So not sure if anybody's heard about that, but um, for those of you who have been ramping up for CECL, which is uh, the change to CECL was uh, no longer giving kind of what happened in the past, but giving a more uh, predictive, um, a predictive piece around that uh, it was the, the change that was supposed to be in, uh, enacted this year. And a lot of people were ramping up. It looks like um, there's been, uh, if you go out to the FDIC, um, there's some information on uh, on the revised transition and in, in the interim finals on that. So uh, you might want to check into that um, if you've been, you know, specifically if you've got all these loans going on. Um, the other thing uh, that um, I thought was interesting is there's been, uh, I saw some guidance on allowing people to avoid the 10% uh, taxation by going into their 401ks and other tax oriented, um, tax relief oriented uh, savings accounts and that uh, up to X amount would not incur the tax. Um, and that's interesting to me because one, um, that money may be coming to you. Um, and so um, I'll put a, a, Melissa probably can find that, I have a link to it as well. Um, Melissa, if you want to check my email, there's a, a link in there I pulled out that you could post in the piece there. But, um, you know, the, that is something I, I think is interesting that could drive a, a lot of, uh, a lot of money into the, you know, cause where they get, you know, they're going to have to withdraw it to somewhere. And generally what happens is, is that it gets withdrawn to a money market or something. You may want to, uh, Think about that. Uh, that was another piece that's either coming or has come. I don't know if, if anybody else has any info on that. Those two things, the Cecil and uh, withdrawals from uh, forgiveness on the taxes on the withdrawals from the 401k. 
John, on the Cecil, uh, it's also what I'm hearing. I think it is uh, codified in the, in the rules, um, but uh, others may be more clear on that than I. But it's really important because the analytics around it, the, the, the math around it, if you go from the, the, the best performing economy that we've had in decades to the worst that we've had in decades, the, the, that is the exact wrong time to enter into a CECL calculation because it's going to show dramatically negative results for the allowance. So it's, it's terribly important and it's terribly important that it be put off for probably a year. Yeah, I'll post in the everyone window um, the link for it. And uh, it's, it's a, there's a guy, oops, that's the Tom. Um, there's guidance for it to, to everyone here. So I'll, I'll put it out there um, for you guys to take a look at. Chris says he's back from Suncoast. And so Chris, thank you so much. Um, and there's a couple questions in the window, which I'll get to after Chris goes over these things. Hey, yeah, John, sorry about that. And he um, was, we just got our, a special link for our PPP loan that we're trying to get posted to our um, online banking sites. They want to put that behind authentication. So just scrambling to get some messages out there for our, for our members. Um, <clears throat> so I was kind of half listening to the conversation. I don't know if there are specific questions or things you want to address. No, uh, just, just kind of interested to hear, I mean, you know, give a little background. Suncoast is an extremely large credit union in Florida. It seems yep. to me you would be tremendously impacted by all that's going on. Would just like to get a, what are you guys doing? You know, sure. what's come up? Sure. So we um, fairly early on shut down you know, our branch lobbies. We're drive through only. We've actually fairly rapidly deployed a lot of our back office staff. We're in, within probably a week, week and a half, we got over half of our back office staff working remote so that they're able to fill in and, and they're helping with uh, calls to our MCC and serve some members that way. So even though our call volume has gone up, our, our satisfaction level has been at 100 and we've had less than a minute call time, call wait times, which is unheard of for us. So we've actually been able to respond pretty well that way. And that's again, um, getting everyone working just uh, remotely has been a big help. The branches, the branch employees are still at this point going into the branches. But again, they're, they're servicing the phones from there. So it's mainly back office, it's been remote. We're, we're starting to have some of our, our branch personnel work remote as well. Is the, um, are the drive ups still open, Chris? They are still open, I believe, yes. Okay. Um, we, we had a big push on loan extension requests. We, we very rapidly deployed um, loan extension requests through our mobile application and our call center application. And well, by getting that deployed and, and leveraging some RPA, I think last week alone, we processed over 11,000 loan extension requests of which over half were automatically processed. The remaining half, everything was, all the booking to the core was done through RPA once the manual decision process was, was completed. Um, we've instituted a life loan um, for our members that they can apply. You know, it's a, I think no interest for first 90 days. Um, we are in the process of upping our or, or we're talking about upping our RDC limits in preparation for the government checks coming out and people wanting to deposit those so we don't end up with a barrage of people calling in, uh, either not able to do the RDC as well as looking at how we remove holds on those checks automatically so we don't get people calling our call center wanting to get the hold taken off a government issued check. So we're trying to figure out how to make that uh, process go a little bit smoother for, for everybody. Um, you those are probably some of the highlights. Right. What's that? Uh, you have a large fleet of ATMs that you run. Yeah. Um, so are you, um, one of the questions we have from the audience is, uh, what are others doing to prepare for potential runs on cash resulting in the relief payments that are about to be sent out? Uh, and while you were gone, we were also talking about a new rule allowing people to withdraw up to 100,000 from their 401k without a tax, um, a tax hit on it. You know, the usual tax hit that you would get for withdrawing early. Um, have you seen any of that in Florida as things start to close down? We have not. Obviously, you know, our, we've worked hard to keep our delivery trucks with Loomis going to our locations so we can make sure we have cash in the machines. Um, haven't heard of any concern yet of a like a rapid withdrawal. Um, but I'll, that's a good, good point. I'll bring that up with our senior staff to see if we need to consider that. Uh, yeah, it was Matt who deserves the good point comment. Um, 
And then on the, you know, your organization, um, one of the things is you have your own developers, you have your own home banking, you have your own mobile. And uh, so it sounds like you've been making some really um, great digital moves very quickly, um, you know, in terms of making changes to the, to the home banking products and things like that to deal with this. Um, has that put a stress on the programmers or are they keeping up with it? They've been able to keep up with it. It's been a little bit of a stress. I mean, the RPA team did a lot of work over the weekend to get some of the loan extension processes built out. Um, luckily, our loan extension process in our online banking app was one of those things that was close to being done. It had kind of been put on the back burner. Um, and with as soon as it's ramped up, we reprioritized that pivot. You know, we're, we're using Scrum within our development team, so we just reprioritized. Um, interrupted a sprint for one of the teams and made that their priority and, you know, and then basically three days wrapped that process up and, and did an emergency deployment to get it pushed out. So it's been a so, push, but we've been, we've been keeping everyone's head above water. Man, you just brought up a great point um, that I want to make sure everybody hears. So for those of you that don't know what RPA stands for, and I'm assuming most of you do, but it's uh, robotic process automation. Um, Chris, I, I think this is one of those things to invest in right now as we see mm -hmm. all this come through uh, and it's not that hard to do. We definitely have connections. We used, uh, we actually worked with your predecessor, Ted, to yep. help with that the UiPath stuff. Why don't you give a little background on how important that's been and what that is and what they were doing? Cause I think everyone would like to hear that because I think process automation and back office stuff is really starting to be an issue. So. Yeah, it's, it's been huge for us and, and I'll qualify it with, I mean, right now RPA is a hot topic. So, if you're looking at the marketing material, it'll make it sound like it can solve everything, yeah, including cancer. possibly cure cancer, world hunger, and everything but COVID. Um, right. But uh, it's it is a great way to very quickly automate highly repetitive processes that have a well-defined workflow. So if it's the you know if it's the the standard workflow, I give it to Sal and she does this, unless this is checked, and, and that's not a good thing. But like. One of our first things we did was travel requests. We had a full-time employee that did nothing but process our travel requests. We, it was get this request in, look at it, go to our FIS website, enter the data. We did that through RPA, able to fully automate those um, and freed up an entire back office of person to be able to go um, do other internal support. We're doing, you know, and for these cases like these loan extensions, once there's, we had a series that can be auto approved, those we just book straight to the, to our core through the API. But then we had a series that needed a manual approval. Once they're approved, there's a whole long list of steps. Then the user's revenue go to the core to fill out that loan extension request. We were able to put those in a queue. Have, you know, once they've been manually approved, put them in a queue. The, the bot is monitoring that queue, picks them up. And it's actually calling an endpoint we expose through our, our backend development so they can book everything to the core. In other cases, we're actually using RPA to interact with the core as if it was a user. Again, it's, it's, it's perfect for those manual jobs, those error prone jobs where you're, you're entering data in one system to go enter another system. Well, that's prone to user error, typos, what have you. RPA is great at picking those things up and doing them. So don't it doesn't replace the need for tight integrations through APIs. Ultimately, that's where you want to go. But what might take three or four months of development, a lot of times you can crank out in a, you know, a week or two or less of RPA development to at least get take the load off while you work on the more tightly integrated solution. Yeah, it's. I know for you guys, it was a game changer. I think it mm -hmm. can be a game changer for a lot of other credit unions. If you're interested in RPA, um, we did a lot of work with our innovation club, which Chris is part of, um, and uh, we brought in UiPath. We went over it. We've done a lot of training, and uh, that could be something, to your point, that takes some of the, uh, the more uh, monotonous, generic stuff and just cranks it out so that people can focus on other things. So um, if you're interested, give us a buzz. We have connections into several of the RPA companies, um, and I think we could help. Uh, design that sort of stuff pretty quickly, similar to what um, Chris's team has done, because I got to imagine that that is like a Swiss army knife that as you guys are talking about things, you're always like, well, can RPA help us? Um, it's, it's one of those things that just has that kind of impact on the credit union from what I can tell. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, Chris, is the Suncoast family okay? Do we have anybody with COVID or, you know? No one. Yeah, no one directly, none of our employees have, have been tested positive with it. Um, we do have a few that are 
um, quarantine because they are around someone that does have it, but no one's come up with it yet. So knock That's on wood, will stay that way. Are um, you guys getting to the point where the main office out in Hillsboro is kind of shut down and, or there's it's, very few people and they're spaced and that sort of it's thing? Pretty, pretty empty. I've actually been working from home for about three weeks straight now. I went into the office the other day and was sort of discouraged to see one of my monitors have been taken because they hand out to some of our others. You know, they're, they're pilfering equipment where they ever they can get oh, so it to get the rest like, of the staff uh, home. It's like Mad Max at, uh, at Suncoast when nobody's there. <laughs> there, there. There was a little metal plate and four screws on my desk where I used to have a monitor. So, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so it's getting pretty empty. But, um, you know, there's still – even our senior staff now, they've gone to where they're alternating days. So half the senior staff is in the office one day and the other half come in the other day just to, you know, maintain a presence but kind of keep people spread out and separated. We've, yeah. we've le leveraging Skype and Teams – quite a bit now for all our communication. That's been working really well. That's great. That's great. Well, Chris, thank you for taking the time. I know you're slammed and uh, we hope you'll come back and, and uh, share with us more. Um, if anybody has any questions for Chris, I, he's a great guy. I'd highly recommend you hit him up uh, by hitting in the chat. I'm sure he's going to stick around a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about something that I thought could help people as well in the same vein. I'm looking for quick things you can do to help uh, one of the things that we've implemented here at BIG that I think gradients can implement very easily, um, if you haven't already, is a chat program. So, um, you know, uh, the, the one I like that's been pretty easy to use is this talk to. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's free, actually. Uh, but basically, if you've ever been to a website and it's got the little bubble on the bottom um, that, you know, hey, can I help you kind of a thing? Uh, that's what this is. And it's... It's something I think you could leverage right now really well because it's, it's pretty well organized. If you could go to you know, your website and, and have a chat on there that's a window that, that people could pull up, um, that would be, I think, really helpful for some questions to get answered that you could also get the, the branches pretty easily involved in because it scales pretty well. But um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good little product uh, and we've had a lot of experience with it. If you're looking for just a quick Maybe it's not forever. Maybe you wind up with something far more robust, but if you wanted to implement something literally this week or, or quickly, I think, you know, and uh, this, this, this thing would be really quick to do. So we've had a lot of good experience with it. It's worked really well for us. So um, I'll put the link or Melissa will in the everyone, but that was another, just a, a tip that, um, so I have a question from Lisa. How do you protect personal info in the chat? Uh, we, we do not do personal info in the chat. Um, what we try to do is direct them if we need to. Uh, we try to answer questions that are not personal info to take those off the call center and uh, to, to deal with that. Or the other option, and you know, I was talking about this before, you want to flatten the curve of your call center, right? So you got the same problem as the virus. You got a limited amount of resources and a whole bunch of people coming in. So scheduling appointments by using maybe that talk to to say, hey, I, I see you have a question. Let me get you an agent and schedule something maybe with a branch employee or something to get on the phone with them, uh, which wouldn't be all that hard in exchange or using those types of things uh, would be very valuable. But the, but the big play is um, just answering the, you know, hey, are you guys still open? You're not shutting down, crazy stuff like that. Or, wow, is um, shared branching working or, do you guys have the PPP loans? Those kinds of things. So they don't have to hunt around your website is very, very valuable. And uh, from what we've seen, it's, it's uh, highly used. So I think it's something that you could easily put in. And it kind of leads me to, um, Gary was talking, uh, Gary from Unitas is here. Unitas is a large credit union in Oregon, Portland, Oregon, and Gary's a longtime friend. Uh, it sounds like they're doing some stuff with this. Uh, they're creating a virtual branch as a top priority project. So. Gary, you want to chat about that a little bit, if you don't mind? Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you great. Hey. So, yeah, we're, we're implementing it. Um, it just got announced yesterday. We're starting to get it staffed up. Um, the focus is to answer for uh, agents to answer uh, email questions, chat. We're launching chat through our interactive intelligence um, phone system. Uh, early next week, we're in testing with it right now. Um, and then also uh, video. We're going to be introducing video. Um, this was on our project roadmap for later this year, but uh, because of COVID-19, it 
came to the top of the list and it's a it's an urgent need so how is it implemented when you say you're having video meetings are they using some particular software or are you you know how are you implementing these video meetings i'm sure everybody kind of wants to know yeah there's like, a um i don't know if we signed the contract with them yet or not there's a, a provider that will also provide chat and some other functions um kind of in a central place um the name of the vendor is escaping me i'll i'll uh, update it on the chat um i'll get the information and update it on the chat okay um so that you know that's one thing too that i find uh really fascinating is that um you know it's uh you know necessity is the mother of invention and uh we're finding a lot of that we actually have a product that we built a long time ago that we never did anything with which is um literally all it is is an inbound text message system so you can have a wide open text me text message system that you can tell everybody about and they can just text and ask questions and it goes to however many agents you want. Now, again, it's similar to uh, what Lisa was talking about. You know, you don't want personal information. You try to guide them to maybe a Skype conversation or a Teams conversation. But I do think that one of our goals as Crayons is to flatten that call center curve, which means scheduling if possible, um, trying to reduce the, the amount of calls by getting ahead of it and trying to make outbound calls. That's one of the things we're talking about is um, you know, Doug and I have had a lot of uh, talk about if there was a service where you could, you know, get outbound calls to people whose direct deposit has stopped, or maybe, uh, you know, searching through the obits and, and getting that done, where you could get those and, and not worry about trying to, you know, everybody wants to get to the point of servicing. No, all I want to do is schedule a meeting with a, a resource, uh, you know, at the credit union, ideally a resource that's not, um, that's not really uh, being cranked down uh, and someone who could help this person. But if you schedule that, you start to flatten your own call center curve. And we've heard over and over again that call centers are at like 120, 150%. We're also hearing that people are quickly using the branch people to, um, to catch up with that. But even with that, um, the volumes are still pretty high. So uh, something to consider if you're interested in um, our messaging system, please hit me. Uh, I got also, you know, if you got people, you could build it yourself. We can show you what we did, but it's a, it's a neat little program that it's just purposely designed to take inbound questions and have you answer them. And I feel like the more avenues that people can communicate with you on right now, that, that's the key. That's the, that's the number one key for the Cravians right now is to open up as many avenues, just like what uh, Unitas is doing for people to get service from you um, or to schedule service from you. So I think that's a, a really valuable thing. Uh, before we go, I want to talk a little bit about remote um, workers. Um, so if you haven't been reading the news, um, the hackers who are also stuck at home are very aware of what we're doing in terms of moving remote, remote workers home. Um, so just to give you an example, uh, so I am partnering with OGO next week. There'll be a webinar called Remote Workers Service uh, Security. and uh, and uh, yeah, I know it's, it's bad. I keep touching my face. Um, but uh, there'll be a, a remote workers uh, security piece where I'm going to play a bad guy. Dang it, did it again. Stop it, Tom. Um, where I'm going to play a bad guy. And I'll give you an example of things that people aren't thinking of. Um, one of the ways I demonstrated during our little demo session with the OGO guys of hacking in is a lot of people have these cameras in their house to watch their dogs or whatever. I don't need to get access to your PC. I just watch the camera. Start getting information there tools to scrape all that information just like i was shoulder surfing at your house so that was an example one those of you that are using vdi you got to make sure vdi is where you let the the um, user use their own pc and not a and not a pc that's given by you um and so that that pc um is uh and the, just one of the crayons that signed up for the, the uh just by way of note, signed up for that CU voice registry uh, to use it for the COVID stuff. Uh, they signed up like a day or two ago. They're already certified now out there. It's done. So that's how quickly we can roll that out if you're interested. So again, CU voice registry. But going back to the remote workers, um, you know, if that person's PC is already owned, it's part of a botnet or something like that, the VDI doesn't help you because 
we'll just chase into it. On top of that, there's just best practices, which we're gonna go over, that really remote workers, they're not used to doing with their home PCs. They're not used to locking their screens before they walk away just to go to the bathroom or to chase down the, the kid that's you know behind the couch unplugging everything. Um, so the, the webinar is um, gonna be on the 9th at 11, uh, 11 a.m., so April uh, next week, and we'll get information out to everyone uh, to watch the website. We don't have the registration info yet, but we'll have that shortly. But if you're interested, um, I'm definitely going to be going over that. We're also going to be going over, like I said, best practices. Uh, we think that people should be putting in place. And if you haven't modified your remote worker, um, you know, a lot of people have a, a, you know, their, their employee security piece that we're all audited on. Um, those are actually going to need updates now because of what we're doing. And so just to keep us in space. And so we're working with OGO on that. That'll be the first half of it is, okay, what are the things we need to modify in our current policies? Um, what are the best practices? And then I'm going to have a little fun. Uh, 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 Gila, is that like Gila Monster, Gary? Is that how you say it? I mean, I assume it it's, is. No, it's Glia. Pronounced, it's pronounced Glia. Glia. I've heard of Glia. Glia is, yeah, I've heard good stuff about Glia. So GLIA uh, is the name of that video vendor if you're looking to use that. But um, coming back to the remote workers, uh, I'll, I'll have a little fun. I'm, I'm going to show some of those hacks and uh, we're doing a little uh, capture the flag so you can see that. And uh, we hope that you will join us. Um, I think it'll be valuable. I worry that we scrambled to do this and there were going to, the, there definitely will be unintended consequences. And uh, we definitely want to help. Um, there's a link to register, uh, which is in the everyone window. And we'll also send that out. So. With that, we have about eight minutes left. Um, I wanted to see if anyone else, um, oh, I wanted to give Dante a, a moment uh, to close us out, to talk a little bit about what he's seeing in the privacy space. Uh, these Zoom windows are becoming a big privacy thing. As everyone moves to more digital online services, we're seeing a lot of privacy stuff. So I don't know, Dante, if you wanted to jump in and, and give a little background on that, what Seal Ledger and Member Pass are doing. Yeah, hi, John. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for uh, uh, joining the call today. Um, on the C Ledger front, uh, you know, privacy is, is of our utmost concern, and that's what Member Pass is all about being able to produce or provide uh, members with digital credentials. Um, we have uh, taken another step to uh, kind of shore up the network of Member Pass participants, right? So you have uh, members that ultimately get Member Pass ID, but um, Used to say that all the credit unions in the network are actually the credit unions they purport to be. So similar to uh, what you saw from John on the voice registry, uh, CU Ledger has taken a couple of our implementation steps and brought them front and center as easy lift items that for the credit union that CU Ledger actually can do up front. And it's, uh, it's called the Member Pass Trust Registry. And so for credit unions that have an inkling and idea they were going to uh, join, uh, member pass at some point. Uh, while today, uh, especially with what else is going on, uh, redirecting your resources, you may not be in a position to actually do a full deployment. Um, you could uh, partake and actually join the member pass trust registry uh, by completing a, a short survey, a few uh, questions, I think eight questions, pieces of information like a charter number and so on, and then actually be uh, logged into the registry. And by logged in, I mean we establish a place for you in the decentralized uh, distributed ledger, and we actually produce the decentralized identifier that uh, is used ultimately in um, authenticating the member pass credential once you get to that point of actually uh, deploying the member pass and issuing credentials. But it would establish you as a, a willing and able verifier of credentials and put your, uh, give you a place on the network, establish and, and continue to create that a digital trust uh, with other credit unions and with your members. Um, it's somewhat analogous if you think of um, the card world where you know you want to uh, issue a Visa or MasterCard at some point in time, but you're not ready with your product and you don't know exactly what you want to do. But the first step is always to uh, become a member of Visa or MasterCard and you get a VIN number when, when you do that. And then ultimately when you're ready to deploy a card product, you act on that VIN number and it becomes you know, the cornerstone or foundation of, of your deployment. Here, uh, an analogous in the member pass world is 
you get the decentralized identifier and we establish that in the network on behalf of your credit union and then uh, through the uh, what John is showing online and he showed uh, the splash page for the actual registry you can actually go into the registry and see what other credit unions have signed into the registry so you have an understanding of uh, who all the member pass players are and you can actually look at your uh, specific information and your decentralized identifier that is created and placed on the ledger for you so it's an immediate first step we'll be uh, opening that site up uh, within the next uh, day or so for uh, credit unions to actually get that head start done and as I said if you uh, move forward with the implementation at a later point in time this eliminates uh, a fair amount of lead time that's normally involved in that implementation. So it'll accelerate your implementation. There's no long-term commitment. If you join the registry today and a year from now, uh, for whatever reason, uh, on a different way than member pass, um, it's easy enough to uh, extricate yourself from that. And there's no, no long-term commitment to, uh, to the registry itself. So uh, we'll provide additional information as we're rolling this out, but I want to make that available. That's a new uh, uh, offering or a feature from CU Ledger that can help, again, accelerate the process and uh, enable the creation of digital trust for your credit union. Thank you, John. No, thank you. I think this is important because what we're seeing is, is that I think this shift that we've seen with the members may be permanent. You know, there's a lot of people who just never wanted to, um, never wanted to, to go and set all this stuff up who have been forced to, and now that they have, I don't know that they're going back. And we're, and we're seeing a lot of surveys around that. And so digitally identifying people is going to be really important. Um, Gary, uh, you know, I hadn't read that Forbes article. Gary, I have one last thing he brought up that maybe might be useful. The National Overdraft Program idea. idea. I don't know much about that. I haven't looked it up. But um, Gary, do you want to talk to it just for a sec? Sure. So I just saw the article come out. It's in Forbes. Um, it's by Ron Shevlin. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Based on an, eco an economist, um, his name's in the article. The idea is for financial institutions, instead of doing the checks to send out for the relief, um, add an overdraft line of credit to the checking account, and the amount of it would be based on the deposits over January and February. So it's not just an unlimited amount. Um, it's a pretty interesting concept. I, I'd suggest people people look at it. Credit unions probably could do it on their own and wouldn't necessarily need to have it be a national program. Yeah, I really like that. Do you have the link for that? Um, yeah, I sent it in an email to you uh, okay. earlier this morning. Okay, maybe you could, um, Melissa, maybe you could pull that out. I've been, you know, my first email this morning was, all of the PPP stuff you filled out is all wrong. Start over. Yeah. Go over nope. No, no worries. That's why I brought it up. Yeah, there, there it is. There's the link. Yeah. Don't go to jail. Don't pass go. Don't collect 200s. Just start over. Well, that's it for this town hall. Um, I hope uh, and I'm so thankful for the people that keep coming like Tom, like Gary. Uh, I hope folks are getting something out of this. Um, and uh, we're thanks. We're thankful to have all of you on. Uh, and uh, if you need any more information, feel free to reach out to me directly. We'll hold a, we're gonna go down to one a week, uh, probably just Wednesdays. Uh, and, but we, I do think we're gonna probably see a few more people show up. I wanna take a moment and thank Chris Hempel for sharing. I know he's very busy. Suncoast is a huge place. And Chris, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Hopefully you got a few things out of that. We'll follow up on some of this. Uh, I'll probably do a recap for this week and, uh, and share what I know and what I've seen uh, and some of these ideas. So, um, and again, uh, if you're interested in the CU Voice Registry, uh, like I said, we're jamming those out quick and uh, we think that might, might, might be really helpful for people just to say, you know, Alexa, tell me what Aspire, you know, tell me about Aspire or tell me what Aspire's COVID response or whatever and you get those, those information. So, um, all right, well, I hope everyone has a great day. Be safe, be careful. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out if even, you know, if there's anything at all you think we can help you with, we, we'd love to do it. Um, whatever it is, we, we'd like to help out. And uh, thanks again to all our sponsors, uh, our newest sponsor, uh, Dante, which we'll have uh, C Ledger and member pass up on the screen shortly, and to Doug Burke, who had to jump uh, and always see broadcast. Uh, Mike's been a good friend and a partner for many years, and all of you that keep coming back. Thank you for your time.
and we'll get this posted. Bye everyone.